want you to open up your Bible to the Gospel of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. My message is entitled, God and I Don't Always Agree. God and I don't always agree. Isaiah chapter 55. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read verses 8 through 11. My text verses will be verses 8 and 9. Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 11. God and I don't always agree. Beginning with verse number 8. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts, Joel. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. God's word never comes back void, does it? God and I don't always agree. Heavenly Father, as we study this subject this morning, Lord, you know that I preach this with deep reverence. But, Father, you always want us to be truthful before thee. And, Lord, I'm praying that this will help my people also. Father, speak to me, in me, with me, through me, and help minister to your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Beloved, I want to speak to you today about an unusual and a personal subject. Namely, that God and I don't always agree. Now, that sounds funny, doesn't it? But it really isn't. I want you to follow me. You see, now the truth is, I love God. And the truth is, usually we get along great, and usually we enjoy each other's company. And usually, even we have sweet fellowship and close fellowship together, beloved. But the plain fact is this. Sometimes God and I just don't always agree. Sometimes God and I have a little controversy with each other because God sometimes asks me to do things that to me seem to make no sense. How about you? God ever do that to you? You lie, you cheat, your feet stink if you say no. (laughs) Okay? Beloved, sometimes God and I just don't see eye to eye on things. And if you're honest, I bet the same is true in your life also. Come on and say amen out there. Don't lie. You see, beloved, I'm saying that there are times when I've had to respectfully disagree with God. I didn't say disobey God. I said that I had to respectfully disagree with God, beloved. Now, I'm not proud of this, and I'll tell you that. Nor am I saying that that's the right thing to do. All I'm trying to do is be honest with you and tell you about how I felt and how I've spoken to God about this thing many times over the years, again and again and again. In fact, I had a little walkabout with God yesterday and talked to him about some things. So I think this is appropriate. About how the things he sometimes says and how the some things sometimes he does, sometimes the things that he uh, asked me to do just don't seem to make sense to me. i got to tell you right now, gentlemen, I'm saying, beloved, they seem to be so unreasonable to me, so unfair. How about you? You ever have that happen? They seem to be so unfavorable, so unsettling in my life, so unequitable of it. And I say to the Lord, Lord, I'd never ask anyone else to do what you're asking me to do right now. So I want, to, I want you to listen carefully today. I, I, beloved, I want you to pay close attention to what I have to say, especially toward the last half of my message, because I think it's going to help a lot of you who have felt like this, but you've been too ashamed and too afraid to be able to say it. But I want you to listen to me, beloved. God does not get angry with us because we sometimes have honest doubts. God does not get angry with us because sometimes we just don't understand His word, will, and ways. I have wrestled with some things for years and years and years until God finally dropped the vignette of truth into me and finally harmonized everything. But I saw that God was trying to teach me how to be a real student and an investigator of the word of God. Would you say amen? 
And I'll tell you this, beloved, my, my convictions uh, have come hard in my life. Uh, and I say that, uh, it, it's, you know how it works in my life? It always that I'm, I'm like a pit bull. I get a hold of something, and I don't get the answer, and I dig it and dig it in, and I finally get the answer, and then three days later he shows me there's been plenty of books out there written about it. And you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> All right. There's nothing new under the sun, Amen. But, beloved, God does not get angry with us because sometimes we have a tendency to disagree with Him. He just tells us this in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, and you know it. He says, Joel, you may not understand this, but trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge me, and I will direct your path, Joel. So that's what God is saying to me. You may not agree with me, Joel. You may not understand, but what I'm asking you to do is to trust me. Come on and say amen out there. Now look at verses 8 and 9 again, please. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, beloved, I don't want you to miss this statement. I don't want you to miss this, beloved. God clearly teaches us here that His thoughts and ways are far different than our thoughts and ways. Amen? So God seems to expect that we're not always going to agree because his ways are so much higher than my ways. His thoughts are so much higher than my thoughts, beloved. And there is an infinite disparity between us, but between what I think and what he thinks. And that's what he's telling us right here in this text. Amen? You see, folks, he knows that our mere mortal finite minds cannot fully comprehend. They cannot grasp his immortal and mind and thoughts and ways, beloved. And I dead sure know that I don't. How's about you? And he uses the word higher. That word higher is the Hebrew word gaba. And it means that God's ways and thoughts are unconventional. They are far advanced. That word gaba means that God's words are so sophisticated and perfect thoughts and ways. And they far transcend. They far exceed. They far our, uh, surpass our very limited and imperfect thoughts and ways. You see, beloved, our ways are limited by the fall. Would you say amen? Our ways, our thoughts, are limited by sin. They are limited by our lack of eternal wisdom, our lack of eternal knowledge that God himself possesses. You see, God is an eternal spirit. He's an eternal being, a supernatural being who possesses all wisdom, who has unlimited knowledge, whereas man... Us, we're but mere mortal fleshy beings whose capacity of mind and understanding by comparison is thumble deep. Thumble deep, excuse me, thumble, that's a new word. Why don't you put it in your repertoire? And extremely and severely limited to the vast ocean of God's knowledge. Imagine it, beloved, a little thimble plop and drop it into the Atlantic and the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And that's what we're talking about here. And that's why God says, my ways are not your ways, Joel. My thoughts are not your thoughts, Joel. Now, that's hard to come to grips with in our flesh sometimes. What do you think? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, therefore, ipso facto, we should inevitably expect, we should assume that God's thoughts and ways are going to rise far above and beyond our own piddly and feeble thoughts and ways. Amen? So although we are made in the image and likeness of God, beloved, the honest fact is we are not God. He is the creator. We are the creature. And his divine nature and intrinsic attributes in every way transcend, exceed, and surpass that of uh, men's like the heavens or the earth, beloved. Therefore, man cannot fully understand all the mysteries that God talks about. Think about it. There's the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the incarnation, the mystery of the kingdom of God. God, unless he took the divine initiative, you and I wouldn't have a clue what it's all about. Amen? You see, beloved, he knows all of the anonymities there is to know and all the obscurities and variables in life because he's a perfectly and wise God, beloved. So Isaiah does this. Isaiah compares the great distance between heaven and earth to illustrate just how much higher and further God's thoughts and ways are than our thoughts and ways. In other words, how far apart the celestial is from the terrestrial. Would you say amen? I always get a kick out of people 
the, you know, beloved, especially young bucks, that they read the Bible a little bit, and all of a sudden they think they know everything. And boy, if there's anything you ever learned as a Christian, is the more, the more you know, the more you don't know, and the more you know you need to know. Amen? Uh, it's just amazing to me. Now, beloved, astronomers and scientists and astrophysicists tell us that this distance between Earth and the limits on the outskirts of the heavens and the universe, they say, is immeasurable. It is incalculable. They even use light years to try to measure and calibrate the distance. And yet, this is the very place where God lives. Isn't that amazing? Solomon said, the heavens of the heavens can't contain thee. Oh, what a big God we serve. You see, everything about God, everything about God is higher than that of man. And I was thinking about this, and I wrote, no wonder the Bible says that at the celestial announcement of Christ's birth, the angels sang, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. No wonder the Bible says that John the Baptist was called to be the prophet of the highest, the Bible says. No wonder the Bible says that uh, um, the incarnate Christ was divinely called the Son of the Highest, and that Christians who love their enemies are going to be called the children of the Highest. On and on and on it goes. In other words, beloved, the word highest teaches us that God alone, no one else, is El Elyon, God Most High. And there's no high like the Most High. Amen? Elyon. The Most High God, higher than, uh, 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 what's the God of the Muslims? Uh, there you go. Both the time you're listening. Higher than Allah, higher than Brahman, higher than Buddha. He's the highest. He's the Most High God. He's El Elyon. Amen? You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying that God alone is the very zenith. He's the pinnacle of all that is moral and all that is spiritual and wise and knowledge, all that is true, all that is intelligent, whereby man, by comparison, the Bible says that we are compared to God like a little flea, like a little bug. Can you imagine that? Imagine a little flea in your hand. I don't care, even a little kid, in comparison, that little flea is nothing. And beloved, what's amazing to me is God says that man's wisdom, now listen, is like a drop of water in a bucket. Isn't that amazing? Well, I got my PhD, DHD, ABC, I got it all. But God says, your wisdom is like a little drop of water in a bucket. See, you're measuring yourself by yourself and comparing yourselves among yourselves, and that's not wise to do, is what God is saying. Amen. So what am I saying to you? I'm saying God is infinite, whereas man is finite. The Bible says that God is immortal, whereby man is mortal. That God is eternal, man is temporal. God is unlimited, man is limited, beloved. Therefore, God sees and foreknows all things, past, present, and future, beloved. We've just entered the continuum of time. I want you to picture a circle. You and I have bloop, dropped into that circle in that line. And that time is going around and around and around, and God says, I've already been there. That little continuum of time that you're calling your life. And so, beloved, nobody, no man, I don't care who he is, can ever plummet the bottomless depths of God's infinite mind, especially after the destructive and the debasing and degenerative influences that sin has had on the mind of mankind. It has affected every area and aspect of our moral and spiritual faculties. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying there's a painful contrast between man and his maker. Amen? You see, we who were once made in the image and likeness of God, beloved, we are now, because of sin, so utterly unlike God. We were made in his image and likeness, morally, spiritually, emotionally, but now because of sin like a cancer, like a yeast going through a loaf of bread, has affected every area and aspect of our life. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying this. Man is selfish. Man's always thinking about what he can get, but conversely, God is selfless. God always thinks about what can I give them. Now, that's something, isn't it? 
I mean, how many people really have altruistic motives when they do something? I wonder if people are going to think about me when they, I wonder if this person will be in great. You're trying not to think that, but your fallen heart is whispering to you, right? Amen? I'm not giving you anything, so don't ask me. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying God in His infinite intelligence and in His moral and spiritual disposition greatly differs than you and I. For example, when offended, God loves to pardon people. That's God's nature. Whereas man loves to punish people and condemn people. We want our pound of flesh. How could you do this to me? That was so wrong. How about all the wrong you did to God? God says, forgive them like I've forgiven you. But we don't like to do that. You see, beloved, God loves to show mercy. We just read about it in Micah. And he passes over our transgressions. But man loves to hate. He loves hostility. He loves to murder. See, that comes right out of our very fallen and sinful nature, doesn't it? God loves to forgive men their sins. He loves to wash it in the blood. He loves to have men clean and beloved, restored and walking with him. Whereas man, man likes to hold grudges and fight. They did that to me, I'm going to do that to them. I'm not ever going to speak to them. And just like a little three-year-old, honestly, beloved, hey, God forgive me, I'm trying to be sanctified, beloved, but I've got to slap someone like that, honestly. I, I just got to tell you, to me, that is a height of infancy. You hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you. Mm. Pow! Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I was just giving you the right hand of fellowship. I just reached a little too far. <laughs> you know? Excuse me. You know, beloved, God loves to reconcile, doesn't he? God loves to reconcile us unto himself. The Holy Spirit in the church is always trying to reconcile people. Why? He's trying to do his work. He wants them to be peace and unity and harmony in the church. And Lord knows twice a day I pray that for TCM all the time, that there's a oneness of mind and heart and unity and togetherness, a spirit of love, peace, joy, contentment within the church. Because I know Satan's always trying to use our idiosyncrasies against one another and our little peccadillos, and we end up pointing this one out and in that one, and John is speaking about that one. But that's not the way God operates, so it shouldn't come as any surprise to anyone that God and I disagree, uh, don't always agree, amen? What I'm saying is because of this radical disparity and difference between God and us, sometimes what God does just does not make sense to me in my fallenness, and I'll admit that, and I hope you can. You see, beloved, I don't always understand it. I don't always see the logic and reason behind it, and so I don't always agree with it, even though I know this. Even though I know he's right because he's God and I'm just a mere man, and even though I know what he does is always just and right and equitable because he can do no evil, he can tell no lie. And even though I know, beloved, that God always does what's best for sinners, nevertheless, sometimes it still irks me because where I want justice and fairness, he often does the opposite. He gives the offender pity and mercy. And I just want to, yeah! You know, I, I get a kick of these people. Somebody breaks into their church. They say, well, we've just forgiven them. You have? You lie. You, you, you said you forgave them. But God says, if they repent, forgive them. Lord, I want to forgive them. I want you to convict them. I want you to catch them. Okay? I want them to come under the conviction of the Holy Ghost. I don't want them to do this again. So, Lord, yes, I'll forgive them if they repent. I won't hold a grudge right now because that'll only ruin me. But I'll tell you what, you don't forgive that somebody repents, right, Matt? Amen? So, you, I'm saying, beloved, God and I don't always agree. See, I'm fallen, He's not. And I'm just trying to tell you how we think sometimes in our fallenness. Amen? You listen to me. Coming to grips with Romans 2.4 has been something I have wrestled with in my life. And it says that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And sometimes to me that seems so self-defeating. It seems so self-counterintuitive. So counterproductive. Why, Pastor? Because many times, many people misinterpret that 
and they look at their sinful lifestyle and all the blessings they get, and they say, well, God must really be blessing me, so he's not mad at the things I'm doing. So they never repent. They never turn to God. They, they're getting blessed like anything else, and yet God says the goodness of God is to lead to repentance. Well, I don't know about you, but that is a burr in my saddle sometimes. How about you? You know, you look at your next door neighbor. They're lying, they're cheating, they're stealing, they're doing all that. And they got new car, new house, new clothes. <laughs> you see, David wrote about this in the imprecatory Psalms. He said he did not understand this until he went into the house of God. Then he said, I understood. When the preacher started preaching to me, when the preacher opened up the word of God, then I started understanding. Would you say amen out there? So you see, beloved, in my flesh, I find it hard to agree with this. But through faith, I've learned to trust in this omniscient God's infinite judgment more than in my own limited, fallen, and finite human one and just believe that what he's saying to me is true, whether or not I can come to grips with it or not. So even when what he does doesn't make sense to me, I've learned it doesn't have to make sense to me because God is not answerable to me, I am answerable to God. Amen? You see, beloved, when God does something that I don't agree with, I've just learned to accept it because I trust that he, whom the Bible says is higher than the heavens, knows exactly what he's doing. You know, when the Apostle Paul pondered the infinite wisdom of God revealed in the mysteries of his redemptive plan for man and the interdependence of both Jew and Gentile in the gospel and how they help one another get saved, the Apostle Paul broke forth in a benediction, a profound one. He stood in awe, beloved, as he quoted Romans 11, 33 through 36, and it says this, it says, Oh, the depths of the riches of both the mercy and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath first given unto him, that he would recompense them again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory. Amen. Would you say amen? Paul says, I don't understand the whole thing. I preach the gospel. You've related, you relate it to me. I see where the Jews fit into it. I see where the Gentiles fit into it. I see the, uh, they're interdependent. But i got to admit, Lord, oh, the riches of the glory of God, how unsearchable are your judgments to me. And so what a benediction that is. But even though after knowing this, beloved, and I've studied that, and I'm sure you have. You've read it in the Word of God. Yet often when we don't agree with what God, uh, we, uh, I should say, we don't agree with what God says or does. And yet often, beloved, we don't see the logic or reason behind it. Have you ever been there? I don't see why you're asking me to do this, Lord. I don't see the reason at all. Honestly, I don't, I don't see the logic about this. Oftentimes, beloved, uh, we don't uh, uh, understand the sense of it at all, and when it does, what I've seen as a pastor is it's thrown a lot of people's faith in trust in God into a tither, into a quandary. They've said to me, Pastor, I have had a crisis of faith in my life because God is saying to me things that are so unlike me, so unnatural to me, things that I would never think of doing or ever want to do. And I say, I understand, but he's God and you're not. Beloved, when it comes to the wrong kind of faith, I've seen three different types of faith regarding God's judgments. God's thoughts in ways, beloved. There's three basic types of faith in Christendom when it comes to trusting in God's higher thoughts and ways and his judgments. Number one, I'm going to give you just these. Number one, there's the biased faith. Number two, there is the benevolent faith. And number three, there's the biblical faith. Now let me go through them quickly with you. Number one, there is the biased faith. People like this think that God will always do exactly what they think should be done. I know you know folks like this. They have confidence to believe that God will solve their problem in the exact same way that they would do it. 
But when he does, they get all flustered and discouraged and depressed in their faith, beloved. Their faith is rocked. Why? Because when they prayed to God, when they thought God would do what they wanted him to do, he didn't do it in their life. So they said, Lord, you don't answer prayer. You're not even hearing what I'm saying. You're asking me to do this, and I don't, that's contrary to what I want to be done. I've got a problem right now in my life. You see, beloved, that's by his faith. In other words, they trust God as long as they agree with God, but when they don't agree with God, they distrust God. Amen? You see, that's what biased faith is, and a lot of Christians have biased faith. They run their life by their emotion. I agree with you, God. Yes, things are going great in my life, and all of a sudden God says, now it's time to get down to the nitty-gritty. Time to make you grow. Time to make you mature in the faith. I'm going to have you doing some things you don't want to do. Now you don't agree with that. Now your feet are in the fire. Now, beloved, the pressure's on. You're under the gun. You've got to make some hard decisions in your life. Oh, you could agree with God when you were doing what he, you thought he would do and everything was going well, but now you don't agree. You see, folks, that's by his faith. Number two, there's benevolent faith. Now, what's that? People like this readily admit that God's thoughts and ways are higher than their thoughts and ways. They have confidence to believe that even if they don't understand what or how he will do it, they trust that someday God will indeed reveal it to them. And they hope and expect that either in this life or the next life, God will clearly show to them why and what he did and why he did it. Now, benevolent faith, beloved, is much better than biased faith, that's for sure. But listen to me, benevolent faith is also a conditional faith. It's a shaky faith. Why? Because it is based upon you playing mind games with yourself. And we all do that. What are you saying to me, preacher? When things don't go your way and you don't understand what God is doing, you comfort yourself by telling yourself, well, someday I'll understand. But beloved, let me tell you something. Benevolent faith like this is predicated upon the hope that God will someday reveal to you why he did it and what he did, but nowhere in the word of God does he ever promise in scripture that he's going to do that. The Bible says the mysterious things of the Lord belong only to him. In Deuteronomy 29, 29, the Bible says the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and our children forever. Why, Lord? We may do all the words of this law. Would you say amen? I mean, the fact is, he's not going to tell you sometimes. He's just not going to tell you. You're going to have to step out in faith like I taught you last week, and you're just going to say, Lord, I don't understand it. I'm just going to trust you and do it. Now let's talk about, thirdly, biblical faith. Biblical faith says something that says, Hey, I may not agree with God in this, and I may not fully understand why or what God is doing here, why he's letting this happen in my life. And I may not ever find out either here or hereafter why he does what he does, but I still have the most complete confidence and belief and trust that whatever he's did, whatever he's doing, whatever he's done, whatever he's going to do, is and was truly in my best interest, so like it or not, Know it or not, it must be right. Why? Because I know, I know that God's thoughts and ways are higher than my thoughts and ways. Now follow me carefully. After having said all that, and what I said to you is absolutely biblical. But after having said all that, beloved, I'm going to tell you some things that God and I disagree on. Now, I'm not going to tell you a whole bunch of them. Because if I did, I'd ruin your faith. And I don't want to do that. See, I'm smart enough to know that I'm smart enough to know that I don't know. <laughs> okay. But I want to talk to you about things we disagree about. Now, this may prompt you to want to fire me as your pastor. <laughs> but that's okay, beloved, because to be honest with you, if you, uh, all I want to do is reveal to you my, my heart, and what I'm trying to do is kind of help you along the trail in, in your spiritual pilgrimage so you can get to heaven, and these things start coming into your mind, and they will. So you may not be there yet. You may not be saved long enough to start asking these probative questions, but you're going to be. So I want to help you. Now, if you can me, beloved, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If you fire me, 
I'm going to put on my Bermuda shirt and my Bermuda shorts, and I'm going to retire to Florida with all the rest of the snowbirds, and I'm going to play shuffleboard till I die. <laughs> or fish like Frank's doing. I'll be out there fishing, playing shuffleboard, beloved. So here goes. Now, remember, I, I told you, I believe and accept everything that God said in his word, rule, and ways, beloved. I've learned to accept that. But I want to tell you some things that God and I don't always agree on. The first thing, beloved, is God and I don't always agree why he let Adam act on my behalf as the federal head or the titular representative of the human race. Now, why well, i got to tell you, right from the get-go, when I read that, I started wrestling with it. I don't really wrestle with it now because theologically I know all the answers. But principally, these things really stick in my saddle like a burr. You see, beloved, I think Adam should be punished for his own sin and, and, not, and me for my sin. What do you think? Why should all men now have to be cursed with death because of what he and his wife did? Why should all men now have to inherit his fallen and sinful nature? Why should all men now have to be spiritually cut off from God and condemned because of his stupidity in the Garden of Eden after God spoke to him personally? Why? You see, beloved, I don't like that and I don't agree with that. Yet I believe that God designed his redemptive plan that way. So through faith I accept it, but God and I don't always agree on this. No, I accept it because I go straight to hell if I don't. <laughs> oh, yeah. Beloved, God and I don't always agree on Noah's flood. What are you saying, Pastor? Why destroy the whole human race along with all the innocent animals that were on this earth? What did they do? I couldn't hurt a dog. Could you hurt a little puppy? I couldn't hurt a little kitty. I'll never forget, I, I, when I came back, I hate guns. I, I absolutely hate them. When I came back from Vietnam, beloved, I did all the shooting I ever wanted to do. I've got some guns, a uh, couple of machine guns, a couple of grenade launchers and things like that. But I, I, no, I'm already can. But I'll never forget, a guy asked me to go hunting with him one day. And in them days, I had a seven-pump Ithaca. Now, today, they have, they have the plug that they put in it, because you're only supposed to have three to five rounds in it. But mine was an old, you can do seven rounds. So I got out there in that little blind, and I went, and little Bambi came along. And I'm looking at him. I said, yeah, just like in Vietnam. I <laughs> and the little thing's going like this to me. The little ears going like this here. And the guy says, shoot him, will you, Joe? Shoot him. I can't shoot him. What did he ever do to me? <laughs> you know what I do with that shotgun? Listen to this. I, I, I sold it to pay a seminary debt. That was a big mistake because it was in Ithaca. They don't make them anymore. And the guy said, oh, yeah, I'll take it. Because I didn't know how much money they were going for now because they were a collector's item. But all that, the, the bottom line, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to get to you, beloved, is I don't understand sometimes why God allowed Noah's flood. I mean, I just don't, beloved. The people of that day, that human race, they did not have the full revelation of God's word like you and I do, right? They had a partial revelation. And of course, Noah was preaching to them, beloved, but if you didn't have a Bible, you didn't have a church on the corner, you didn't have anything, would you have scratched your head a little bit? and say, is this guy nuts, or is he telling the truth? And beloved, there must have been some good people, like lovable grandparents, what do you think? Oh, Aunt Millie over here, Uncle Harry over there. What about some children? What about little babies of that time? Did you ever think about that? Every one of them were destroyed, except for eight people. So I gotta tell you, beloved, there's some things I don't understand about that. How about you? See, and I don't always agree with God on that. I accept it. I know that it's true. Biblically and theologically, I can defend it. I know what it says in the Word of God. But in my heart of hearts, I have to say, dear God in heaven, that really gets me right here. And you want to know why, beloved? I'll tell you why it's hard for me to agree with it. Because each and every one of us in our human experience can identify with those people. Before I got saved, I read again and again. I read it in the Bible about being saved, yet I didn't fully quite understand it. And God bore with me. So, beloved, there must have been something that 
uh, when God revealed himself in them days and with Noah or whatever uh, that I don't quite understand, I accept it. I just had a hard time agreeing with it. Also, beloved, God and I don't always agree on why he let Satan do what he did to Job. Now, if you've ever read the Job, uh, book of Job, beloved, the Bible says that Job was a just and a righteous and an upright man, and there was none like him in all of the earth. No man like him. And then God has to name drop. Oh, so Satan, you've been searching all the men out. Huh? Considerest thou my serpent, Job? What? I, I was, Lord, what are you doing? No, go, go tell him to look at David. No, no, look at me. <laughs> Actually, the Greek construct, I mean, the Hebrew construct says, So thou hast considered my servant Job, huh? See, Satan saw that he was a righteous man. But the fact of the matter is, what I'm trying to get at, beloved, is this here. Why let the devil destroy all of his property and cattle? Why let the devil rob him of all of his wealth? Why let the devil kill all of his children and family in one day, one day? You told me to thunder out from the pulpit, Lord, I'm trying. Job attended ten funerals for his kids. Oh, beloved, it's hard enough going to one funeral for a departed. A loved one like that, amen? How about two? How about five? How about seven? How about ten? Did you ever think of that? One day, watching his children being put into the ground. So why the devil? Why did God let the devil physically afflict him with painful boils from his head to his toe? And he suffered so much. The Bible says that there was pus oozing out of his body. He had to go to the city dunk dump and take pieces of pot shirt and scrape those pustles so they could drain off of his body. And beloved, so while uh, God let the devil uh, also <laughs> have a wife like Job, a taunting wife, why don't you curse God and die? And Job said to her, thou art a foolish woman. <laughs> Don't you know it's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious woman on a rooftop? <laughs> That's what I said. What about you? And not only that, beloved, why did God allow Satan to let Job have these judgmental friends whom Job says, you're nothing but miserable comforters to me? Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, Elihu. What? These guys... Man, you're supposed to be coming all this way to help me. You're telling me I'm in sin, I'm not righteous, I'm not doing... No, that's not right, that's not right. You know, some saints, regarding all of this about Job, beloved, some saints have said this. Listen, they said, Lord, if this is how you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few. And these were saints, godly saints that were persecuted, beloved. Now, I can understand their sentiment, and they said it reverently, Amen and respectfully. And beloved, God and I don't always agree on polygamy. In other words, that men should have several wives, because to me that sounds so moral and it sounds like misogyny to me. What's that, preacher? It is the exploitation and degradation of woman. So I don't understand it. How come a woman didn't have nine husbands? <laughs> They'd have killed her. <laughs> But yeah, can you imagine, I mean, if, can you imagine having 700 wives and 300 concubines like Solomon? Mamma mia. No wonder he was probably worshiping stones by the time they got through with them, right? Imagine, 300 concubines. If, if 700 wives can't take care of well, let's see who we got. I'd ah, say, I go through my Rolodex here. Yeah. Who's this woman, Elizabeth? <laughs> Where do we get it? Mesopotamia? Oh, okay. And beloved, God and I don't always agree on why he had to test Abraham by asking him to sacrifice his only son Isaac. Why should any man have to be tested like Abraham and have to choose between serving God or killing his son? Beloved, you hear me now. This was his only son, the son of his old age. It wasn't like there was going to be a lot of coals in the stove left afterwards. He could have more children. 
This was the son of his old age. I probably should shut up because me thinks that by the time I get through, you won't even believe in God. <laughs> but that's not the point, beloved. The point is that I'm trying to show you why we disagree. God tested a good and elderly man in his old age. And that's far above my thinking. How about yours? I want to comfort old people. I am an old person now. And I know, beloved, what it's like to lose your strength. <clears throat> and your marbles. <clears throat> Not me. I was crazy once. <laughs> you see, beloved, God and I disagree about why he chose Jacob over Esau. Have you ever really studied that story? Beloved, Jacob was an effeminate little mama's boy. He'd rather play house and hold on to his mother's skirts to be a man of the field and a hunter like his brother Esau. Listen to me, Esau was a man's man. That's what the Bible teaches, beloved. He was a man's man, while Jacob was a lying, cheating, conniving little fairy who stole his brother's blessing and birthright, and he always ran to Mama for protection afterwards. Mama, Mama, Esau's going to hurt me. Mama. Well, we just tell you the story. That's true, beloved. That's in the Portuguese version. You can see it if you look it up. Look the Lisboa section. You'll find it there. So God and I don't always agree is what I'm saying, beloved. You see, I don't understand why he struck P. Rez Uza dead just for trying to steady the ark with his hand. P. Rez Uza wasn't doing anything disrespectful or irreverent. He was just trying to steady the ark so it wouldn't fall off of the cot. Yet God struck him dead, and they called it P. Rez Uza from that day forward. Why? Because God says only the Levites, the Kohathites, are sanctified in my sight that will ever touch that ark. So he struck P. Rez Uza, even in the goodness of his heart, and God struck him dead. And I don't understand why God tells me to love my enemies when they love to hurt me. And beloved, I've had threats. I've had threats. People are going to shoot me with machine guns and come by. Okay, I had the police tap in my phone and I had to go and buy a pistol. I've never fired it. Imagine I bought it, but I never fired it. I don't want to fire it. And I don't understand why he wants me to suffer myself to be defrauded when I know that person is dead wrong in what they're saying, but yet for their soul's sake, God's saying, Joel, shut up. Bite the bullet. You agree with that? I don't like that. How about you? And I don't understand why God allows and sends adversities and afflictions into my life. I woke up yesterday when my jaw was out to here. My back was out to here. I was trying to say I love my wife. I went, I love you. I love you. <laughs> I don't understand, beloved. And you know, it's always on the heels of me rebuking someone. Someone who's dead wrong, not re reproving him, trying to show them from the scripture, and Satan will just stick his nose in there. And I'll tell you another thing. I don't understand why God lets Satan and demons attack me in the spiritual battle like he does. Again and again and again. It's absolutely relentless. Can you imagine having to go out to your car every day and pray that it will start? Turn on your computer. Oh, dear God in heaven, thou who sittest in the highest, touch this through thy power. <laughs> Because, you know, Satan's going to worm his way in there. And then when you hit the wrong button and everything's gone. I remember one day, I'll never forget it, I first got my computer. And Brother Dave is the one that talked me into it. Brother Dave, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Just want you to know that. So I, I didn't know that you were supposed to save the things you were typing. I thought it was automatic. So I had this big, you know, the big monitors used to be like that. You had to carry them like this. And, and so I went, good, done. <laughs> what? Where, where is it? And I looked high and low. I couldn't find my son. <laughs> so my house is an old house, and I have windows, uh, they're, they're big windows, and uh, they come to about a foot off the floor. And I had just had my driveway tied. So I opened up the window, all the way up, no screen on the window in them days, picked up that computer, and Ellie's saying, don't do it, Joel, don't do it. <laughs> I was going to chuck that baby. 
I'm going back to writing my own outlines with my hand. <laughs> don't do it. You see, beloved, I don't understand why God tells me to suffer and sap, sacrifice so much for a Christian. Do you understand? I, if you do, come and send me a letter, will you? So, Lord, I'm sorry. I love you. I trust you, Lord. I worship you, O God. I magnify you. I try to obey you. But in my flesh, I just don't agree with some things that you do. And I know that doesn't mean anything to you, Lord. And I won't tell you any more because I don't want to ruin your faith. So in my flesh, beloved, I have a hard time coming to grips with some things. However, in my soul and spirit, I accept them. Why? Because I know that God is the sovereign and supreme creator who does not need to explain himself to his creatures. Because I know, beloved, that God is in sovereign control of his redemptive plan for man, and I'm not. And I know that intellectually, and so I have to make sure my soul and my spirit override my flesh and override my mind. And I know, beloved, that God is the one who works out all things according to the counsel, the Bible says, of his own will, his own eternal purpose. And I know, beloved, he's the eternal self-existent one who's almighty, who's omnipotent and omnipresent and omniscience. And he knows all things, many things that I will never know in a thousand lifetimes. And so, Lord, I know that you alone have the supernatural ability to seek and to search out the deepest, innermost interior regions and recesses of man's hearts, to see the true motives and inclinations of the heart and the desires of the heart, why man does what he does. And I cannot do that. I can only see the outward action. And every time we try to judge someone's motives, 99.9% .9 of the time, we get it wrong. Would you say amen? And we end up doing that to a lot of people. You did that because, of, oh, honestly, I didn't do that, but you won't believe it anyways. But you act as if God has appointed you, the Holy Spirit, to see into their heart. And Lord, I know that you alone see and comprehend and understand all things from a divine and unlimited perspective, contrary to my very limited one. And Lord, I know that you alone have infinite wisdom and infinite knowledge, so your ways, your thoughts are infinitely higher than my little piddly thoughts and, uh, and uh, ways. So therefore, in my ignorance, I've had to say, Lord, I readily admit, I admit it, Lord, because this subject vast difference between the profundity and the depth of what you know and what I don't know that through faith I have to agree with what you say. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, I look at God sometimes and I look at his infinite mind and the thoughts and ways and I said, Lord, these things are too wonderful for me. Like David, I cannot attain. I'm going to have to study eternity to learn some things. How about you? So you hear me now. I've said to God, it's because of my ignorance that I don't agree. And Lord, your bigness, your bigness of your mind, the bigness of your being, the bigness of your wisdom and knowledge and infinite intelligence far transcends and it far transcends time and space. So, Lord, I admit, you were right about Adam. He should have acted as the federal head of the race. And, Lord, you were right about Noah's flood. You should have destroyed everybody except for those eight people. And, Lord, I admit, you were right about Satan, allowing him to test Job. And, Lord, you were right about polygamy. And you were right about Uzzah. And you were right about Jacob. And he saw, oh, beloved, hear me now. God's deeply pleased when his children say, Lord, I know, I know your thoughts and ways are higher than my thoughts and ways. And I know I don't really understand you. And I know I don't often see the logic and the reason behind you do what you do. And I know I may not always agree with you, but Lord, I'm still going to trust in your person. And I'm still going to trust in your power. And I'm still going to trust in your promises. And I'm still going to trust in your providence. Why, Lord? Why? Because I know, I know you know more than I do. I know you always do what's best for me so I can glory, praise, and honor you. Would you say amen out there? Even though in my flesh, God and I don't always agree. 
But I humbly submit to his thoughts and ways, beloved, because they're higher than my thoughts and ways. How about you? God and I don't always agree. Let's go to the throne of grace.